Thank you for joining us. This is the Alt Dev Student Summit, and we are very pleased to present Rebecca Fernandez. Um, if you want to ask Rebecca a question during the end, during the questions and answers phase, uh, you should find the link for that underneath the video that you're watching just now. Um, if you would like to join in the conversation that's happening on the internet in general, use the hashtag hash alt dev conf, uh, and everybody can find everybody the, that way. Right, so without further interruption, uh, over to you, Rebecca. All right, hey guys. Uh, so I just wanted to talk today about starting and running a company, and as I'm a program, this is all from a programmer's perspective. Uh, so first of all, I'll just kind of talk about who I am. Uh, it's kind of important. So I'm actually the a chief marketing officer of an indie startup here in Australia. Um, so our startup is called Convict Interactive, and we are currently making games for PC. I'm just going to plug this once then, only once. So we're, our game is called Triangle Man, so please check it out afterwards. Um, so we're all actually programmers. So straight out of school, we we kind of looked at the industry and it was right when everything was kind of collapsing in Australia so a lot of places closed down and there, there weren't actually that many places to work. Um, so we decided to make our own company uh, and apparently this makes us entrepreneurs so uh, that, that was a new word that I've, I've kind of I hadn't really thought about before we started making games like I guess the other thing we wanted to do was make games we hadn't really thought about the whole business side of things. Um, so yeah I guess that that's we are now all entrepreneurs because we're kind of trying to bring our idea to the world. Um, I also help to run IGDA Sydney. So we have a pretty big uh, group here in Sydney. The Facebook page has about 1,000 members, I think. And we hold monthly events where we get roughly 100 people. So it's pretty big. Um, so I get to talk to all sorts of different people from the industry, whether that's AAA developers, uh, bigger indie studios such as Halfbrick, uh, as well as the smaller indies like myself, and also the students. So I, I get a pretty good, uh, yeah, there's a pretty good range there. I can talk to a lot of people. Um, I also lecture and tutor at the University of Wollongong, so I uh, teach computer science. Uh, so I have a pretty good idea of, of that whole like programmer mindset, um, and, and it's great to be able to kind of pass on knowledge to students as well. It's something I really enjoy. Um, so what I wanted to do today was kind of share our experience so far. So like I said, we're all kind of straight out of school, and, you know, all programmers. Uh, we had really no idea of the whole business side of things. Uh, so I kind of wanted to hopefully share what we'd learned, which might fast track your experience. Um, and hopefully kind of help you avoid the mistakes that we made. So we've made so many mistakes, like we had no idea what we were doing. It's kind of trial and error. So hopefully I can kind of uh, steer you clear of those. I um, also want to kind of try and explain ideas uh, and concepts in, in kind of easy to understand terms. There's a lot of, a lot of kind of jargon and, and business talk um, that we had no idea about and has taken us some time to learn. Um, so a bit of a disclaimer first. Uh, I don't know everything. Uh, on the contrary, I, I think I know rather little. Uh, I've never worked for a, a big studio on a huge title. Um, you know, coming straight out of school into an indie studio, you're not going to work on anything large. Um, so I'd, what I just want to do is kind of share what I know. Um, so as someone who has come out of a programming degree, um, you know, someone not long out of university, kind of trying to make their own games and trying to make their way in the world. And hopefully this is something that you, a lot of you can relate to. Um, second disclaimer is that I live in Australia. So I, you just listened to Tim's talk, so hopefully our accent it's fine, it's no problem, but if you didn't understand something I've said, because I talk rather quickly when I'm a bit nervous, uh, you know, feel free to ask at the end. Uh, however, there might be some kind of discrepancies in, in terminologies and, and policies that I talk about, since a lot of what I do know is, is the Australian law uh, and that kind of thing. I've tried to look at a few different, um, a few different systems, but I, I really only looked at the UK, the US and Australia, since that seems to be kind of uh, the people I've had the most to do with. Uh, also, I'm really bad at art, so this is why my slides look terrible. Um, yeah, art is really not one of my fortes, and put to demonstrate this, I, I kind of showed you guys where I live. So this is a nice uh, drawing of Australia, it looks more like a blob, and that red spot is kind of where I'm from. Anyway, moving on. So what am I going to app on uh, about today? Uh, so this is a different topic that I wanted to cover. Um, 
And just a bit of a side note as well, because I said I'm Chief Marketing Officer, some of the stuff I talk about will will be a little bit about marketing, but I didn't want to cover too much of what was already talked about uh, this weekend. So I'm going to try and stay clear of most of the marketing things and, and just talk about the business stuff. Um, okay. So moving on, so forming a team is kind of the first thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and this is one of the things that would be a good thing to think about before you start, instead of just kind of leaping into whoever you've already worked with, which is what we did. Um, so the first thing is kind of how many people you want on your team. Um, so the f I'll just go through a few of the kind of typical uh, groups. So the first thing is, uh, you know, a single person team. Um, so if you've got a few skills and you want to kind of try your hand at making games, or just kind of do it in your spare time or something like that, this is this is one of the ways to go. Um, so it does mean you've got to have, a, there's going to be a lot more work. Um, you know, and you've got to have you know a range of different disciplines that you're quite comfortable with. Um, so you're not only doing your own art and, and programming and design, you just also have to have the grasp on kind of the business marketing uh, type jobs. So there, there's a fair bit of work involved, but you do get to keep all the profits, which is kind of nice. Um, and it is also kind of less complicated tax-wise because you're really only looking after yourself there. Um, so I have a, I have a few friends that are you know just single people teams and they have some successful games out there so this is this is definitely a viable option. Um, so next one's a small team. So this is pretty common for, for indies. Um, for example in our studio we've, we've kind of got the four main uh, four main people and you know you still need to kind of wear multiple hats. Um, like I said I'm a programmer but I do also kind of take care of the marketing. Um, we have, you know, programmers who are mostly doing design. Um, actually, most of it is kind of programmers doing something else. But, you know, you get the idea. You do have to have a kind of different range of things that you need to do. Um, this does mean you can get work done, you know, well, theoretically, it means you can get work done faster and better. So, for example, like I said, I'm terrible at art. If I was to make a game by myself, it would look horrific. So ideally, it, you know, if I was going on to make a new studio, I'd be looking for an artist. Um, to team up with because I know that the game would be much better with someone who actually knows what they're doing in that area. Um, you can start though to introduce problems, so for team dynamics. Um, are you all going to be equal team members? Are you going to employ contractors? That kind of thing. You do have to also kind of, you know, deal with all the, the conflicting opinions that might appear. Um, so the last one as well is a large team. So this is pretty rare for indies. Uh, especially experienced ones or ones straight out of school. Um, there's definitely a need for a, a clear leader, a project manager here. You, you wouldn't all be on equal footing in a large team like this. Um, I don't really have much experience with large teams, so I don't really want to talk about them too much, but uh, there are some independent studios, mostly the more established ones who've been around for, you know, say 10 years, have this kind of big team like this. Uh, with with uh, our company, so we already had a close-knit team who had made some great games together before. You know, we've been to a lot of game jams and, and worked on a lot of things together. We're all quite comfortable with each other. And, you know, for about three years before we've actually formed the company, we've, we've uh, been doing things together. So that's kind of why we decided you know, we, we hadn't killed each other yet, so it was a pretty good sign. We just went on to continue working together. Um, however, we, we were, and I guess still are, short on artists. We don't have a full-time artist in, in the office. Um, and that's kind of hindered our our production a lot, actually. Um, so I'd say when you're forming a team, definitely make sure you try and have a good balance, which kind of brings you on to the next slide. Uh, so who are you going to need? So I guess <laughs> these aren't really in any order. I just tend to write programmers first, sorry. Um, so these are kind of the different, I guess, the basics of, of who you'll need there. So, so you have your programmers, artists, musicians, designers. Uh, and it's up to you whether you have like a, a dedicated business marketing person or, you know, break those jobs up between you. But it might be a great idea to kind of bring someone on the team who isn't a game developer but has a good business head, uh, if you can find one, which we haven't been able to. Um, so I just wanted to show you this. This is the uh, a page for, like it says here, Australian and New Zealand game developers. And they've got a, a jobs posting page. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys briefly, which means we're going to go away from the talk, hopefully. No. 
Oh, there we go, yeah. Okay, so I just kind of wanted to show you this quickly in that, so these are the latest jobs available uh, around Australia. Uh, so here you can have a look at all the different uh, professions that have been added. So these are all uh, jobs that have been added by by different companies who are looking for people. So as you can see here, these first ones are kind of admin positions. Um, so if you're in a small industry, you're going to have to cover all these yourself as well. Um, also art, uh, so we've got 2D and 3D art there. So like I said, we're looking for artists. We actually had uh, people who were good at 3D art, like quite, you know, you know, quite comfortable and, and talented in that respect. We really had no 2D artists. So, so, you know, make sure you're kind of, uh, I, I guess, a more well-rounded team would be a good way of putting it. Uh, so art, audio, design. There's a whole heap of different types of designers there: writers, production, uh, a big fat list of different programming roles. So, if you're in, where are we? So. You know, there's quite a number of different things that you have to be responsible for. Um, so next thing is, is where are you going to work? So we started off, I guess, working from home. Uh, so this is my desk here, which looks a lot messier than I thought it was, but anyway. Um, so we started off working from home, and what we did was we all sat around uh, on TeamSpeak uh, to chat, and that was quite good because we kind of immediately got to ask one another about problems we were having or just kind of planning out things. Um, we also use Google Wave a fair bit, which was amazing. We're pretty sad that it's gone. Um, we're actually about to go back from working from home, actually. So now that we don't have Google Wave, we're probably using something like uh, Internet Relay Chat as our, our main communication. Um, while we're doing this, though, we also did make sure to meet up physically once a week, which helped us to kind of stay on track if, if some of us had started to diverge from, the, I guess, the, the vision of the game. Um, kind of kept us in sync, so we're all working together quite well. Uh, and also kind of kept us better friends. We didn't turn into crazy loners. Um, so we then got an office, which is appropriately titled Office, uh, which is really a bit more of a shoe box. Um, and this was great. It was, you know, it kind of we had a momentary boost of productivity. We were pretty excited that we could just turn around and talk to the person behind us. Um, it, it seemed even more immediate than what we were doing already. Um, oh, before I go into that one, we're actually currently in a small business incubator. Uh, if you can find one of these and you really are in good hands, um, it, it's it's fantastic. They kind of, like I said, incubate small businesses. They're helping small businesses like ourselves to get up off the ground. Um, and it's really interesting to work uh, in a big office where there's a lot of uh, you know keep, a lot of people keeping busy and moving forward. It really kind of motivates you to go off and do the same. And you get a lot of help in, in fields you might not understand. So there's you know. Uh, on other successful entrepreneurs in there who can ask questions from you, whether that be business or sales or marketing, that kind of thing. Uh, and also legal advice and accounting and that kind of stuff. Um, so back to this one, I mean, you don't have to all be physically located in the same place. Um, so if you're working from home, you really can't be anywhere. There can be problems in, in, in this, though, that if you're not all in the same time zone, uh, quite obviously, as we kind of experience here in alt dev conf, it can be hard to find a time that suits everyone for meetings and that kind of thing. And someone's probably going to have to be awake at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and it can be hard. Like we said, we met up physically once a week. I mean, that's not really going to be possible if your team's distributed all over the world. Um, but if there is someone, you know, you've got a friend uh, in the US, you've got another friend in Germany or something like that, and you really think that you've worked together quite well, this is definitely an option. Okay, so I just want to talk about company structures. So I kind of researched the three main ones, uh, which might be called something something slightly different where you're from. Um, so just jump straight into them. So a sole trader. So this is like the whole one-man band thing that we saw earlier, in that you own everything, uh, you have full control, and you take all the profits, which is nice. Um, there are fewer formalities involved in setting up, so there's there's a lot less paperwork and it's somewhat cheaper. You don't have to spend a lot of money on legal fees to kind of set this all up. Um, it doesn't actually mean you have to work by yourself. You can you can hire people, so you contractors rather, not employees. Um, so you know even if there's something you can't do, you can kind of hire someone to do that for you. Uh, although you do have to have the money to pay them, I guess. Um, However, you and your business are legally treated as the same entity. So in name, uh, so if you just kind of set something up without doing uh, a lot of the paperwork, 
uh, it's a business is, is kind of huge. So if I went off, I'd, I'd kind of create a business called Rebecca Fernandez. Um, although you can change it, obviously. Um, and you're, you're kind of treated the same tax-wise. So your tax, your business tax is the same thing. So when you go off to do your tax at the end of the year, the income to your business is just treated as your income, um, which makes it pretty easy, actually, when you're, when you're doing that. Um, however, if you kind of going to, if your business goes into debt, your personal private assets can be lost. Uh, so, for example, if your business starts to owe a lot of money, they can come after your house, your car. So that, that's kind of scary. Uh, also, you can't sell uh, shares or stock, as I believe they're called in the US. Um, it's just like shit. It'd be like selling pieces of yourself, I guess. So, if you're trying to raise uh, some money through investors, which I'll talk about soon, uh, you can't really do that in this case. Uh, so partnerships, this is pretty much uh, just like a sole trader in that there's there's more than one person. Um, so I've got written here, register as self-employed and you submit separate tax returns. Um, you do need to create a partnership agreement, so I guess, you know, that's kind of, so there's a little bit more paperwork than what's involved in a sole trader. Uh, it does mean that the, the workload and risk is shared. Um, so I guess maybe you'll only lose half of your house. Um, but there, there can be a bit of a problem uh, if partners have a falling out. So, well, I guess if you've done the partnership agreement properly, you'll have something in place in case that that happens. Um, but if not, then you might run into some trouble. Um, so this one is just registered with your, your state. Uh, to be able to set up a partnership. Okay, so a company or a corporation. Um, so in this case, the, the business and the members are treated as separate entities, so you're not, if the business goes bankrupt, you're safe, um, which is a bit nice. I mean, you're out of a job, but you know, there you go. Um, so the idea is here, you need to uh, establish a business name and register with your state or country. Uh, so I think it's in the US that you must register with your state. Most other places seem to be a uh, you know, the federal government's job. Um, so it normally has a board of directors or officers. Uh, so this is you guys. You don't, it's not, a board of directors isn't like some, you know, faceless men in suits. This is actually just you, you people who are starting the company. Um, this actually might be a requirement in order to set up the company. There might be, there's, there might be legal requirements that every company has to have a board of directors. So you do need to nominate those when you start up. Um, and so it also gives you the ability to sell shares and have shareholders. Um, so if you wanted to raise some money, then uh, you can sell this to investors. Um, okay. So that's, it does mean that there's a lot more paperwork and expense to set up and maintain. So um, you have to have all sorts of agreements in place and, and you know, registering business names and business numbers and, and all the tax information. Uh, can be quite uh, time-consuming and, and expensive. Um, and also, if you're, in this case, you need to kind of hire employees. So I guess if the company is, is hiring you, so you are an employee of your company, uh, this means you need to kind of uh, comply with all those po all the policies involved in that. You need to pay for superannuation or Social Security uh, or I think Medicare uh, for all your employees. Uh, and this also means that you're going to be taxed twice. So I guess the company is taxed, the in uh, income to the company is taxed, and you know possibly at a state and national level, and then also the individuals uh, are taxed on their income from the company. So there's kind of good things and bad things about both of those. So just one more thing about tax, in that uh, it, it's kind of sucks, but you're going to have to sell your games to the US. It's a pretty big market, and if you if you actually want to be you know viable, want a viable product, you, you're going to be selling your games to the US. Um, which means you kind of have to worry about their tax and legal system, which is really confusing. Um, and some of the distribution channels you're working with will make you handle the tax yourself. So, for example, um, I mean, not handle the tax yourself, but you do need to kind of give them information. So, for example, we worked with Xbox Live Indie Games uh, in that we had to fill out all these forms. So we had to grab uh, a taxpayer identification number, which looks like this. If we open that up. Okay. Oh, it's open in Internet Explorer. That's lovely. Nope, nope, nope. 
Um, so you're applying for a tax identification number or something you're going to need, and this is all really confusing, and actually provide instructions as well, which was the next link, which I won't show you. Um, so that's the one that you send to the uh, IRS, which is the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, I don't actually know much more about them, apart from we had to fill in a form and send it to them, and they didn't actually apply the US uh, tax to our stuff. And also this one here, which is the W8BEN, uh, which is the one that you send to your payer, which kind of gives them all the info about your uh, American tax uh, information. Uh, so this is one we sent to Microsoft. Okay, so the game, which I want to talk about briefly, so I'm going to kind of hopefully try and steer clear of the, the marketing aspects. But I guess the kind of game you make does impact on your business decisions. So, for example, who you're selling the game to is, is going to influence a couple of things. Um, so if you're making a game for toddlers, teaching them the alphabet or something, you don't really want to call your company Sex XXX Incorporated because that's not going to really go down very well. So you've got to make some decisions based on who you're selling the game to. Um, also, the pricing model that you're going to use. Uh, there's something to choose from these days, whether that's uh, traditional sales, uh, you know, DLC, in-app purchases. Um, also, the platforms you're going to release on, uh, so console, PC, handheld, that kind of thing, uh, whether you're selling the game, physical, digital, um, and also what you're going to use to build the game. So all these kind of things are going to impact on the way your business is running. Um, so and they're kind of all documented in the business plan. So I guess having a business plan, this is something that a lot of people don't really bother with, uh, but it is quite helpful. So it kind of outlines who you are and what you do, which is kind of important because uh, you'll start to change. I mean, you won't do everything you will, but once everyone's kind of growing and learning, you'll start to kind of change what you're doing. So you've got a business plan that kind of keeps you on track and where you want to go. Um, helps you set real business goals and milestones. So you need to make enough money to uh, getting dinged. Was that the end, Luke? Nope. Okay. Um, this is kind of to, to keep you on track and, and make sure you're making enough money to be able to survive. Um, and also breaks down these steps in achieving these goals. So I guess our overall goal was make enough money to survive, but there are many different goals involved in that way. Um, so it's kind of like, for the programmers, it's kind of like top-down design for business. Uh, you can also work backwards, uh, you know, breaking each goal down into smaller goals. It also keeps you focused. So if you've got this business plan hanging around, you can check back on it to make sure you're on track and, and you know what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so it doesn't have to be fancy or terribly formal. Like ours is just a Google Doc. Um, but it can be... I'm just going to skip through this because I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, so it kind of documents all the stuff we've talked about so far. Um, and also has things like a financial plan, a budget, kind of, you know, all the expenses you're going to have, and financial projections, which is kind of where you want to be financially in a few years' time. Uh, also the market analysis, so the, the industry you're entering and how do you fit in and stand out, which is kind of important. Uh, also risk analysis. So just like risk analysis in software projects, we're kind of looking at all the things that might go wrong. You have the same thing in a business document. Okay, so money. So just going to briefly talk about these things. So the you know, all the budget you've done before, so all the wages and software and hardware, how are you going to pay for this? Making games is kind of expensive. So there's a couple of different models, which I'm just going to skip through really quickly. Um, so this is what we're doing, which is uh, bootstrapping, which is kind of building a business with low money. Um, so all of us work for a share in the profits of the game, uh, so we don't actually earn a wage. Uh, so this means we've kind of kept our day jobs to pay for things here and there and, and kind of work around that. And also, the, we don't actually spend much money on marketing, so you know, we kind of slip out a little triangle man into various different places, whether that be IGDA meetings or on the uh, Australian Games Review Show. Uh, so there's another way is crowdfunding, which you can kind of use in conjunction with bootstrapping. So most of you should know about Kickstarter. Uh, there's also another one called Indiegogo, which actually lets you keep profits even if you fail. Uh, I mean, even if your, if your project fails. Uh, and also Gambitious, which is another one that actually sells company equity, which sounds a little bit dangerous to me, but you can actually sell shares in your company uh, for people. Uh, this was actually our campaign via Posible, which is an Australian version. Um, there are many hidden costs in this. I'm not going to click on this link, but uh, you know you do have to kind of spend that money immediately to to send out the stuff to your supporters. So you'd be very careful of what you're kind of adding on there. Uh, also, investors. So this is something that I had absolutely no idea about. 
So we've got um, it's two things called VCs and angels. Uh, so VCs kind of uh, are kind of more later round funders. They're going to give you a lot more money. So I guess the lowest is really you know half a million dollars. And they're giving out other people's money. So this might be retirement funds or you know returns on investment from other companies who've done well. Uh, and they generally want to put someone on your board of directors and and can act as mentors. And these people are, who are like professional investors. This is what they do for a living. Uh, and there's also angel investors, and they're actually giving their own money. And then they take more of a hands-on approach. They might be coming to a do a, and actually want to work with your company um, or be an advisor. And they kind of give you a, a lower amount of money, so it's kind of at a, a more startup stage. Uh, this is also pitching. So this is something you're going to have to do in order to sell the game, whether that's to an investor or to a publisher um, or to get some sort of deal. So that can be a presentation like I'm giving now. Uh, an elevator pitch, which is a pitch, which is a sentence that imagine you're stuck in an elevator with someone, um, and you're you need to sell the game to them before you, before they get out. So it's something that's like a minute or two away to describe your game. Also a pitch document, um, which is kind of what it sounds like a presentation, but it's all written down in a document. There's actually some good examples of those on GamePitches.com, which I suggest you have a look at. Um, Right before I finish, I just want to talk about some opportunities and other options. There's a lot of different meetups, whether that's IGDA um, or other games meetups, but there's also small business meetups, and those are really helpful to kind of move you on. That's how we actually found out about our small business incubator uh, locally and also grabbed a few mentors. There's a lot of people who turn up there to try and help small businesses out. Also, free stuff. Uh, we are part of BizSpark, which is Microsoft's kind of small business startup uh, help. And we actually get all Microsoft software, well, most Microsoft software for free for three years, which is fantastic. Uh, and there's actually no strings attached on that. Uh, so I guess this is a summary of what I just talked about. Um, and apart from that, I think that's me done. Sorry I had to rush those last few. I didn't realize I was going to go so over time. Um, so feel free to check out our website, uh, follow a company on Twitter or myself on Twitter, uh, or send us an email if there's anything else you wanted to know. Awesome, uh, okay, thank that's you. it, Luke. <laughs> uh, we are actually really tight for time, so I'm not going to be able to take any questions. We do have a couple of questions that have come in, though. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'll forward them along to you afterwards. Yeah, sure thing. Okay, um, so thank you very much, everybody who's been uh, watching live. Uh, if you hang on for a couple of minutes, we've got our closing keynote about to start. Uh, thanks again to Rebecca for this session. I think it's all been very informative and uh, a very good guide to a very hands-on approach to getting started, um, which we haven't actually had anywhere else. I'm surprised. I was expecting lots of these sessions to overlap. Uh, cool. So thanks, Beck. I'll uh, catch up to you in a bit. Uh, everybody else, hang out for a couple of minutes while we get set up for the other session. Thank you.